Roberta Holloway uh, taught in this department from, uh, went, th went uh, graduated from this department, and I think also got her PhD here, and taught at uh, English at San Jose State University for um, 40 years. She uh, never married. She had a professor's income. She published w one book of poems that uh, I know of. And when she died, she left um, a substantial amount of money to the English department so that young poets could, uh, younger poets, as she specified, could come here and spend a semester because that was what she would have liked to be able to do more often than she did. And, uh, and also so that the Berkeley students would be around uh, uh, the new poetry as it was happening. And uh, th the gift over the years has just made an enormous amount of difference to us. We've been able to have the reading series. We've been able to have the, what is now known as the Holloway um, postdocs post and, uh, and also the Holloway fellow in the practice of poetry, and who is this year um, uh, Matt Zapruder. So everybody, we're a, a memory for Roberta Holloway, who did us an enormous and generous kindness. Matt Zapruder, we're very glad to have in our midst this semester, was born in Washington, DC. He went to Amherst as an undergraduate and studied Russian. And then he came to Berkeley and, and got a, a master's degree in Slavic languages, and then went to the University of Massachusetts, also in Amherst, uh, for an MFA. He's published three books of poems. Uh, American Linden in 2002, The Pajamaist in 2006. That book was named one of the 10 best books of poetry in the year by Publishers Weekly, and, uh, and it received the William Carlos Williams Prize, which is a very handsome prize for the best second book of poems published by an American poet. Um, and we get to celebrate, to, and, then, and then he published in 2007, a collaborative translation or a translation with a, another uh, person of uh, the late poems, a book called Secret Weapons, the late poems of the Romanian poet Eugene Jebelandu. Um, and last year, uh, a collaborative project with a painter, uh, a book called For You in Full Bloom, which is published by Pilot Books and which is a gorgeous thing, and I don't think we have a copy of it here for sale. What we're celebrating today, as well as Matt's being with us, is his new book, Come On All Ye Ghosts. Um, uh, his other prizes. He was a Lannan Literary Fellow. He won the May Sarton Prize from the American Academy of Sciences. Um, Online, I learned that his favorite novelists are Jose Saramago and Haruki Murakami, which speaks to very good taste in novelists. Uh, it's hard, for, I was trying to think about his lineage um, as a poet. Certainly, there's some evidence of, uh, because he studied at Amherst, of James Tate. Um, someone described James Tate's poetry as Surrealism, if surrealism was a Buddhist baseball team from Kansas with a, with a devilish mustache and wild eyes. Uh, there's an element of that in Matt's work. There's an element, I think, of the, um, uh, it's not surrealism, expressionism, actionism of the, of the great um, uh, Slovenian poet Thomas Shaleman, who read here a couple of years ago. I think, I think the New York School poets are in there, Frank O'Hara and Kenneth Koch especially. Maybe a touch of the middle generation of America, maybe of Tony Hoagland and, and Dean Young. Um, one of the revealing lines to me in the new book is uh, about Matt's poetics is, um, uh, that he speaks of uh, 
standing in an actual stance of mystery and not knowing toward the world. I think that's often the exact place where his poems begin. When making notes to myself, I was saying, I think these poems are made out of, in this order, wit, panic, um, bemusement, and imagination. That that's almost all, what the hell is going on is almost the starting point. He likes a plain, almost flat-footed language. The words huge and terrible show up in his poems a lot. And just when you think the language is ordinary, he, the other thing I was, metaphor I was thinking of is his poems are, are like the pockets of language turned inside out and seen from the other side. For example, People talk a lot. The more they do, the less I remember in one of my rooms someone is always dying. It doesn't spoil my time is what spoils my time, is an example of that kind of surprise I mean. Another one that I loved goes, it goes like this. I think it's a poem he read the other night. I see sad crushed plastic everywhere and put some thoughts composed of words that do not belong together together those two togethers that I fell in love with. Um, another example of the things he does with diction that are quite amazing are, uh, is, um, if you don't mind me quoting from you so much, Matt, is um, this that I can find any second. A man sits in the Institute of National Memory examining files this is the sentence winding across several that I'm interested in. They contain accounts of what certain people believed other more powerful people would want to permit themselves to believe regular people were choosing to do all through the years that like terrible ordinary babies one after another crawl grasping daily acts and placing them into these files anyone can now hold. He's capable of just astonishing you in small ways by unwinding what seems like an ordinary syntax into, into complete surprise. It's really a terrific pleasure to have him among us. We're very happy to be here to celebrate the new book. Please welcome Matthew Zapperberg. It's a, it's a real honor to be here. I'm turning on my clock. Because I can't, I don't like a watch. It doesn't feel good on my wrist. So you know that about me just, just to get started with. I don't like a watch, so when my retirement comes up. Um, thank you, Bob, very much for that introduction. It's, um, uh, you know, it's an honor to have you talk about my poems. You didn't mention yourself as being someone who, whom, from whom I've learned a lot, and also Lynn, two people sitting right here. So to be on the same uh, faculty, if it, only for a semester, with poets um, whom I've learned from and saw read when I first was starting to learn to write poetry here at Berkeley when I was uh, studying Slavic languages and literatures is um, just, I don't know what to say, except thank you. So I'm going to read um, some mostly poems from this new book, which just came out. So I'm still getting used to it. And I might read one new poem. We'll see how things are going. And I'm going to start with the first poem in the book. And uh, it's a poem that I wrote when I, I was at a party. And um, I used a word. It was a writer's party. Horrible thing, a writer's party. And uh, I used a word that I was sure that I knew what it meant. And I was corrected. And I, of course, defended myself. And then it turned out, because everybody has like these things that they could look stuff up right away, which is awful, right? And so it turned out I was wrong. And then I, and then I, um, I uh, went home and looked, thought of some other words, or checked some other words that I thought maybe actually I also didn't know what they meant. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Turned out there were there were there were there were more than a few, but this so the title of this poem is three of those words, and then the poem goes on from there. Erstwhile harbinger auspices. 
Erstwhile means long time gone. A harbinger is sent before to help, and also a sign of things to come. Like this blue stapler I bought at Staples. Did you know in ancient Rome, priests called augurs studied the future by carefully watching whether birds were flying together or alone, making what honking or beeping noises in what directions? It was called the auspices. The air was thus a huge announcement. Today, it's completely transparent, a vase. Inside it, flowers flower, thus a little death scent. I have no master, but always wonder what is making my master sad. Maybe I do not know him. This morning, I made extra coffee for the beloved and covered the cup with a saucer. Skeleton, I thought, and stay very still. Whatever it was will soon pass by and be gone. Um, the issue of syntax is interesting. I, it's something that I was real interested in, not interested in because it makes it sound like an idea, but I guess drawn to, maybe viscerally drawn to when I was first writing poems. And I think it's because I studied, really, the first poetry I studied was Russian poetry as an undergrad and as a graduate student here. And the Russian poems are, are organized differently because of the different grammatical um, uh, uh, structures of the languages. And I could explain why, but then we'd all be very bored. Um, but uh, the, uh, so I was always interested in how you could pull things apart and put them back together in different ways where they didn't belong. And it was really just a kind of feeling I had that maybe other sorts of emotions or reactions in myself were waiting for me if I did that. And, and they were. They weren't always. I would do that a lot, and it wouldn't be interesting, but then sometimes it would be. But that was more, um, that was where that, why that was such a big part of my poems, I guess, when I first started writing. And then it's always, be, still stayed something that I care about, but I think that also I care a lot about um, writing and reading poems that are direct and co connect me directly with you and other people. So it's maybe maybe a mixture. And as time goes on, you know, who knows? We'll see what gets more interesting. That's the great thing about being a poet is there's always something waiting. Uh, this poem is called Automated Regret Machine. And also, I just want to say one other thing. In my class, um, my great class that I have, we were talking about political poems. And I guess uh, this is, I guess this is a political poem. Automated Regret Machine. My friend and I were watching television and laughing. Then we saw white letters begin to crawl along the bottom of the screen. People were floating on doors and holding large pieces of cardboard with telephone numbers scrawled in black fear up to the helicopters. The storm had very suddenly come, and now it was gone. I saw one aluminum rooftop flash in sunlight. It would have burned the feet of anyone trying to wait there. My friend by then had managed to will her face into that familiar living detachment mask. I thought of the very large yellow house of the second half of my childhood, how through my bedroom window I could reach my hand out and upward and touch the branch of an elm. At night in the summer, I heard the rasp of a few errant cicadas whose timing devices had for them tragically drifted, and the hoarse, glassy call of the black American crow. Though I am at least halfway through my life, Part of my spirit still lives there, thinking, very soon I will go down to the room where my father carefully places his fingers on the strings of the guitar he bought a few years before I was born. Picking his head up, he smiles and motions vaguely with his hand, communicating many contradictory things. Changing things in the middle here, always a bad idea. This poem is called Lamp Day. Lamp Day. 
All day I've felt today is a holiday, but the calendar is blank. Maybe it's lamp day. There's one very small one I love so much I've taken it everywhere, even with its loose switch. On its porcelain shade are painted tiny red flowers, clearly by someone whose careful hand we will never know. Because it's lamp day, I'm trying to remember where I got it. Maybe it was waiting for me in the house on Summer Street I moved into almost exactly 17 years ago. I think without thinking, I just picked it up from the floor and put it on my desk and plugged it into the socket, and already I was working. So much since that moment has happened. On lamp day, we try not dreamily, but systematically to remember it all. I do it by thinking about the hidden reasons I love something small. When you take a series of careful steps to solve a complex problem, mathematicians call it an algorithm. It's like moving through a series of rooms, each with two doors. You must choose one. You can't go back. I begin by sitting on a bench in the sun on September 21st, thinking all the walks I have taken in all the cities I have chosen to live in or visit with loved ones and alone make a sunlit and rainy map no one will ever be able to hold. Is this important? Yes and no. Now I'm staring at clean metal girders. People keep walking past a hotel, its bright glass calmly reflecting everything bad and good. Blue boots, bright glass, guests in this moment. A child through the puddles steps exuberant, clearly feeling the power. I'm plugged in. I'm calm. Lamp day has a name. Just like this cup that has somehow drifted into my life and towards which sometimes for its own reasons my hand drifts in turn. Upon it is written the single word Omaha. This poem is called They. They. I remember the house where I first lived. It was small and wooden and next door to a loud, friendly Catholic family whose three sons, Andy and something and something else, constantly with mysterious lack of effort, flicked an orange basketball through a rusty hoop and one afternoon taught me, duh. Once a car screeched and hit a girl whose name I just remembered, Julia. We weren't there, but came running out. It was quiet, and we stood a little away from the man from the car who stood over her. There was a dark spot on her leg. It was broken. She was fine. But they decided to limit the danger by making the street one way with a speed limit of 30. Who were they? Since then, they have been here, looking over my shoulder, sometimes taking care, at others making the wrong decisions, leading to more bad things. There's no way to talk about it, except maybe right now. Now, when I look at photographs of me and the twins, I hear the green glass beads separating my bedroom from theirs clicking in my mind. Is that a memory? or what I know those sorts of beads sound like in a breeze. Every day, one block up to Connecticut Avenue and over to Oyster Bilingual, where I sometimes was asked to stand in front of the class and hold up the picture of a duck or a house when the teacher said the words in Spanish and English both. I played Santa in the Christmas play, which made sense. One day, Luis stabbed another kid with a pencil in the throat. He was also fine. Another day, I went to visit a friendly girl and ran straight through the plate glass window in her apartment building lobby and out the door and home. My parents never knew. I was, as I would now say, unscathed. 
Soon after, we moved to Maryland, where the new Catholics were threatened and mean. But that's a different story I don't yet remember. I think once a parent dies, the absence in the mind where new impressions would have gone is clear. A kind of space or vacuum related memories pour into, which is good. I read a great quote from Augustine's Confessions today where uh, he's talking about how he was a bad writer when he was in his 20s. He was, he was bad at everything, but he, you know, he was not a good writer. Like he, he was not a real writer, I guess he was saying. And he was talking about how um, he was like a person who was looking at things and the sun was to his back. And so all the things he was looking at were bright, but his face was dark not illuminated, and that made him a bad writer. <laughs> it makes sense. In, in context, it makes sense. I thought that was just so beautiful, though, the idea that somehow your face has to be lit up, too, even just like a little bit. Um, this poem is called Poem for John McCain, who doesn't need any of our help, unfortunately. Looks like he's going to be just fine. And I wrote this poem during the election when I was filled with absolute hatred for this person, which didn't feel, which felt mostly good, but a little bit not good. And a little bit not good part of the way it felt is maybe what. Plus, I just like having a t really hard task as a poet. I'm sure that many of you can identify, like as hard as possible. And this is a hard task. No. Poem for John McCain. Today, I read about the factory where they make the custom rolling ladders. Everyone has probably seen rising through silent rooms full of boxes or shelves crossed by moats in the sun. Number five is my favorite, made of black walnut with its hinge that folds a small surface out for reading or placing books on as you shelve them. It's easy to imagine working in a library. For me, at least, there's something shameful about how clearly I can see it, like I'm thinking something important is not. I say tomorrow waits for me, but I don't know. If I knew anything about the wars, besides what I've been safely told, I might understand why they call him a maverick when he's really just a horse, a horse like me, except with dark eyes, terrible from his useless suffering. Do you think he would like that? I don't think he would like. I mean, he might like it. Kind of. He might like it. No, sort of. I mean, <laughs> that's true. <laughs> Though I, I this, the one I had a poem in the New Yorker once, like, and the but where the poem. The reason I'm telling the story is where the poem was was there was a long article on John Ashcroft, who makes John McCain look like the Easter Bunny, and. Um, like literally, and the uh, and the poem was on the back of the pic. There was a huge, pic, horrifying picture that you should, that children should not see, of John Ashcroft. You know, like really, a really scary picture. And then on the back was my poem. <laughs> so of course, what did I think? I wonder if John Ashcroft read my poem. <laughs> you know, that's, that's all I can think about. But I do wonder. Um, okay. Uh, this poem is called A Glow. A Glow. Hello, everyone. Hello, you. Here we are under this sky. Where were you Tuesday? I was at the El Rancho Motel in Gallup. Someone in one of the nameless rooms was dying. Slowly, the ambulance came. Just another step towards the end. 
An older couple asked me to capture them with a camera. Gladly I rose and did, and then back to my chair. I thought of Paul Salon, one of those poets everything happened to strangely, as it happens to everyone. In German, he wrote, he rose three pain inches above the floor. I don't understand, but I understand. Did writing in German make him a little part of whoever set in motion the chain of people talking, who pushed his parents under the blue grasses of the Ukraine? No. My name is Ukrainian, and Ukrainians killed everyone but six people with my name. Do you understand me now? It hurts to be part of the chain and feel rusty, and also a tiny squeak, now part of what makes everything go. People talk a lot. The more they do, the less I remember in one of my rooms, someone is always dying. It doesn't spoil my time is what spoils my time. No one can know what they've missed, least of all my father, who was building a beautiful boat from a catalog and might still be. Sometimes I feel him pushing a little bit on my lower back with a palm made of ghost orchids and literal wind. Today I'm holding on to, holding on to what Nico Case called that teenage feeling. She means one thing, I mean another. I mean to say that just like when I was 13, it has been a hidden pleasure, but mostly an awful pain talking to you with a voice that pretends to be shy and actually is, always in search of the question that might make you ask me one in return. I'm going to read one more poem, and then I'm going to read the title poem of this book, which is a little bit longer. And then we're going to be done. That was OK. Sometimes people say, sometimes I say, I find myself saying just two more poems, like I'm apologizing to you for having read, you know? And then I'm like, oh, I not apologize. <laughs> Never apologize. Um, this poem is called A Summer Rainstorm. Sometimes I'm happy to be here in this bright room, drifting through music made by others, looking down on the heads of the people passing, teaching each other that life is foregoing. I think everyone I can see is partially sad because we will never be fully forgiven. This apartment building has seen so much moving through the city. Well-ordered troops, many proud, careful mothers and fathers pushing carriages, many people holding hands or talking on their cell phones and crying, hundreds of girls each wearing a plastic tiara carefully placed on her head by the mayor at the annual spring parade. This building with the ordinary green facade, no one will see as they wait for the storm to pass, their breath creating giant cloud forms. From my window, I can see their heads. It makes me smile a little with love, how much they look like moose in the zoo, how they stand very patiently close to one another under the door of the sky, their memories gracefully blundering into the long, cool forest full of shadows. Our life is the one we already have. And this last poem is called Come On All You Ghosts. And it's in five sections. And I'll do this for each section. Two, three, four, five, six. Come on, all you ghosts. I heard a little cough in the room and turned, but no one was there, except the flowers Sarah bought me and my death's head glow in the dark keychain that lights up and moans when I press the button on top of its skull and the ghost I shyly name a glow. Are you there, a glow? I said in my mind, reader, exactly the way you just heard it in yours about four poem time units ago. Unless you have already put down the paper, 
directly after the mention of poetry or ghosts. Readers, I'm sorry for some of you, this is not a novel. Goodbye. Now it is just us and the death's head and the flowers and the ghost in San Francisco thinking together by means of the ancient transmission device. I'm sorry, but together we are right now thinking along by means of an ancient mechanistic system no one invented, involving super microscopic particles that somehow, weird, enter through your eyes or ears, depending on where you are right now, reading or listening. To me, it seems like being together, one body made of light, clanging down through a metal structure for pleasure and edification. Reader, when I think of you, you are in a giant purple chair in a Starbucks, gradually leaking power while Neil Young eats a campfire, then drinks a glass of tears on satellite radio. Hello, I am 40. I have lived in Maryland, Amherst, San Francisco, New York, Ljubljana, Stonington, house of the great ornate wooden frame, holding the mirror the dead saw us in whenever we walked past. New Hampshire at the base of the White Mountains, on clear blue days full of dark blue jays, beyond emotion jaggedly piercing. Minneapolis, of which I have spoken earlier and quite enough. <laughs> Paris, and now San Francisco again. Reader, you are right now in what for me is the future, experiencing something you cannot without this poem. I myself am suspicious and cruel. Sometimes when I close my eyes, I hear a billion workers in my skull, hammering nails from which all the things I see get hung. But poems are not museums. They are machines made of words. You pour as best you can your attention in, and in you the poetic state of mind is produced, said one of the many French poets with whom I feel I must agree. Another I know writes his poems on silver paint in a mirror. I feel like a president raising his fist in the sun. Reader, it doesn't seem very strange to be here in this apartment thinking of you and how we will someday, right now, be together. I hear hammering. Workmen are fixing the front steps. As I step out over them into the morning, my mind is wearing a black suit like a funeral director's assistant, prepared for very serious work that has nothing to do with me. Now in the cafe, very carefully blasting my veins with coffee, asking what do we know and what can we learn. Above me, a painted waterfall and stars on the ceiling. All this peace makes me feel queer. The mysteries, the mysteries we could never have predicted. They become our lives and less confused calmly in them we rotate, not psychotic or tragic. I have lived in the black crater of feeling every moment is the moment just after one has chosen forever to live in the black crater of having chosen to live in the black crater. And therefore I know exactly why David Foster Wallace took his life away from himself, even though he was also taking it away from everyone he knew. This morning I was woken by soft, sour breath, a slight fleck of metal in the organic, like a field of titanium gravestones growing warmer in the sun. I could breathe it for hours, but now it is gone, which is okay, as long as the exhaling somewhere else continues. Her job is to incrementally regulate the conduct of those who regulate the city, and mine is to be happy for a few moments thinking I could actually be one who is happy, watching afternoon fog pour predictably down into sunny Noe Valley from cold Twin Peaks. If you know the story of Marco Polo, you know after a long journey, he came upon the Mongol armies, sleeping and wisely turned back, already composing a much more fabulous story than not being able to report being torn apart by four horses attached to his limbs. From then on, wherever he went or did not, he brought back wondrous marvels and lies. In this poem, 
every word means exactly what it means when we use it in everyday life. So when I say, I went to the grocery store and felt too ashamed to ask where are the eggs, only a very small part of me means I have returned to report we have by our mothers been permanently destroyed. <laughs> when the president opens his hands, a doorknob made of an unnaturally heavy substance floats up the blue door to the worry factory. Open it and down drift all the 21st century problems. Stick out your tongue and maybe you will taste sunlight and maybe ash. Go, little president. We're all blowing into your wings. We promise to no longer be transactional in our personal dealings. We promise no longer to know some things are important, but one does not need to know why. If the heart makes the sound of two violins sleeping in a baby carriage, then new technologies cannot make us both more loyal and free. Wayward, free, radical dreams. I want to be loyal. I say it once into the darkness. Come on, all you ghosts. Try to make me forget you. Come with me, and I will show you terrible marvels. The little cough I heard in my mind was one I remembered my father made just as he died. We weren't sure if it was his last breath or just some air left in his lungs. Not that it matters. Please don't feel the least bit sorry for me or yourself. Everyone you have ever seen has a dead father. Some are just walking around alive, but it's temporary. So bring your sorrow for everyone out into the street in the sun. If a nation can fall asleep, it can wake up, not exactly angry, but a little dizzy with pleasant hunger, a glass of juice, a melancholy. Then remember, we all have something important to do today in the sun. Come on, all you ghosts, all you young holding hands or alone, all you older people and people of middle indeterminate age, we need you. Winter is not through with us. The sea seems more than a little angry, and over it blows a very cold breeze that is also the color gray. In this room with its black desk, Sometimes I hear the crystal factory whirring under a sky the color of black tabletops, entranceways, and dead light bulbs. Are those your hands on the switches, ghosts? All day I've been feeling blind, dizzy, and enclosed, as if I were being carried in the hand of a great being who insisted he was still, but I could feel the motion. Come on, all you ghosts. Bring me your lucky numbers that failed you. Bring me your boots made of the skin of placid animals who stood for a while in the snow. Bring me your books made of blue sky stitched together with the thread made of the memory of how warm even the most terrible among us has felt the skin of his or her beloved in the morning to be. Come on, all you ghosts. Try to make me forget one summer lost in a reservoir and another I keep in my chest. Come on, all you ghosts. Try to make me repeat the most terrible thing I said to someone, and I will, if the mind of that someone could ever be eased. Come on, let's vote for no one in the election of who is next to die. Come on, all you ghosts. I know you can hear me. I know you are here. I've heard you cough and sigh when I pretend I do not believe I have to say something important. Probably no one will die of anything I say. Probably no one will live even a second longer. Is that true? Come on, all you ghosts. You can tell me now. I've seen one of you becoming, and I'm no longer afraid. Just sad for everyone, but also happy this morning I woke next to the warm skin of my beloved. I do not know what terrible marvels tomorrow will bring. But ghosts, if I must join you, you and I know I've done my best to leave behind this machine. Anyone with a mind who cares can enter. Thank you.
Matthew Zapruder, thank you very much for extraordinary, beautiful reading. Um, all of you, thank you for coming. There are copies of uh, two of Matthew's books here, um, thanks to the Cal Bookstore. Um, they're for sale. You can, or you can come look at them. And the English department invites you to a reception in the English department lounge. I think probably everyone in this room knows where that is, but if you don't, go out, turn right, and turn left, go down the hallway, and just above the stairs on your right is the lounge. Um, so, yes, again, thank you, Matthew.